You know, most of these uh, little studies start with somebody asking a question. Sure. It used to be me asking the questions. Uh -huh. But you got other people not necessarily asking a question, but saying, how can this be if this is what I read in this Bible? Right. And we did something sometime back about religious right. syncretism. Right. And what that did has made people... In fact, this is all spurred by somebody making the comment, there's no such thing as syncretism, especially in Christianity. <laughs> and Can't we all just get yeah, along? Yeah, well, the, the whole idea <laughs> of syncretism not, was, in fact, to make us all get along. Yeah, man's, man's <laughs> efforts at it. Yeah. It was man's efforts of blending all of these ideas into one. But the, and that's where we are today. Sync. <laughs> it's gonna be one of days. One of days, okay. <laughs> Syncretism is the merger of different and at times contradictory religious practices, faith, and beliefs to reconcile different religious traditions found within a community and to find unity between competitive views. In other words, get us all on the same page. There you go. Syncretism in the Old Testament involves Israel's absorption of Canaanite religious practices into the religion of Yahweh. The syncretism arose in Israel because Israel did not practice its religion in isolation or detached from its Canaanite neighbors. And when Israel conquered the land of Canaan, the books of Joshua and Judges say that the Canaanite cities were not destroyed. Rather, many Canaanite cities were left unconquered, and as a result, the Canaanites lived among the people of Israel. People will find a way to get along if you just leave them alone. I mean, didn't we do that before we were even a species, let alone? It all I mean, works better if we don't make it official. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Well put. Abraham and his family came from a culture where syncretism was a fact of life. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons, Abraham and Naor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. In fact, Abraham's ancestors, Peleg, Serug, Naor, and Terah, were named after the names of gods mentioned in documents from other Mesopotamian sources. Now when Abraham left Haran to come to Canaan, he and his descendants met the Canaanite religion and their gods. These gods were worshipped in sanctuaries located in places like Sechem, Bethel, Mamre, and Beersheba. And although there is no evidence that the patriarchs worshipped the gods of Canaan, the Old Testament reveals that the people of Israel eventually became involved in the worship of gods of that land. If Israel went to Egypt and lived there for more than four centuries, then the people of Israel were exposed to the Egyptian religion as well. Although it said Israelites were forced to build cities for Pharaoh, most were not impressed by the many gods, because it is said some people in Israel accepted the Egyptian religion. When Joshua renewed the covenant with a new generation of Israelites at Sechem, Joshua urged the people to abandon their Egyptian gods. Now therefore, revere Yahweh and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve Yahweh. And after the people of Israel entered the land of Canaan, the people of Israel worshipped Yahweh, while the Canaanites worshipped their local gods. Gradually, the people of Israel took over the worship places that once belonged to the people of the land, and eventually the religious practices and these cultic centers became thoroughly Israelite, focused on the worship of Yahweh only. It is said that the reason syncretism practices became prevalent in Israel was because the covenant that Yahweh established with the people at Sinai and did not require Israel to deny the existence of other gods. Rather, the covenant required Israel to worship Yahweh alone as the only God of Israel. You must not have any other gods before me. But when Israel chose to worship other gods, the prophets criticized Israel for violating the demands of the covenant and the worship of other gods intensified after Israel conquered the land of Canaan. The new generation of Israelites who entered the land with Joshua was not familiar with agricultural life and had never learned how to cultivate an arid land to produce crops. And Yahweh was not an agricultural god like Baal. And the land of the Israelites now had to grow crops and produce pasture, for their flock was believed to belong to Baal. 
It was Baal who produced crops and increased the flock and herds of his worshippers. It was this belief that tempted many of Israelites to abandon Yahweh to follow other gods and goddesses who had promised them grain, oil, wine in abundance. It took many years, but Israel finally decided that it was not Baal, but their god Yahweh who had been giving them their grain, their oil, and their wine. So Israel said, I'll run after other lovers and sell myself to them for food and water, for clothing of wool and linen, and for olive oil and drinks. Hosea told the people that the giver of these blessings was Yahweh and not Baal. And Yahweh said, Israel did not know that it was I who gave them the grain, the wine and the oil, who lavished upon her silver and gold that they used for Baal. The religious traditions of the northern kingdom, also known as Israel, were preserved by editors who lived in the southern kingdom. They were the ones who gave the final shape of the material available to them. And before Israel established a united monarchy under Saul, the nation functioned as a loosely organized tribal state. The threat posed by the Philistines forced the leaders of the twelve tribes to call for a centralized form of government to deal with the Philistine threat. The election of Saul was the first king of Israel, brought a sense of unity to the confederacy. However, the election of Saul did not bring much political, religious, or economic change to Israel. And although Saul was anointed as the king of Israel, he functioned more like a judge. He gained power by the anointing of Yahweh and his position as the leader of the army. However, the tribal structure did not change much since the tribes clung tightly to their independence, and it was not until Saul died and the Philistine threat increased that the nation recognized the need for more centralized government. When the elders of Israel came to Hebron to anoint David as king of Judah and Israel, David recognized the need for a centralized government. One of his first acts as king of Judah and Israel was to conquer Jerusalem and established the city as the capital of the united monarchy and as the center of the political life of the nation. He also brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. The presence of the Ark in the new capital established Jerusalem as the religious center of the nation. David's priority was to complete the conquest of the land, and with his victory against the enemies of Israel, David incorporated the conquered people into Israelite society. This large influx of non-Israelites into Israel forced the new king to introduce some foreign elements into the social and religious life of Israel to accommodate the needs of this large number of foreigners. David's appointment of Zadok and Abathar as priest demonstrates his deliberate efforts to keep a balance between the two segments of the population and their religious traditions. Abathar was from the family of Eli, whose line came from those who had served at the sanctuary at Shiloh and his appointment was an effort to address the religious needs of the people of Israel. The appointment of Zadok, a priest who probably represented the Jebusite population, served to meet the needs of the Canaanite population that continued to live in Jerusalem. And by appointing Zadok as a co-priest, David was attempting to assimilate a foreign cultic tradition that existed side by side with traditional Yahweh worship. Do you catch that before you go any further? Uh -huh. Zadok, as in Jack, that's the same, that's the same family, that priest line. Yeah, and he was trying to assimilate the two together. The two together. Right, right. So that's how we get those stories, by the way. The two accounts of this, the two accounts of that. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. The establishment of the United Monarchy served to promote the worship of Yahweh. Now, although the monarchy was mostly a political necessity, the establishment of covenant between Yahweh and the house of David ensured Yahweh's blessings upon the descendants of David and the people and ensured the people's devotion to Yahweh. The writer of Kings said, For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Melchon, the abomination of the Ammonites. Then Solomon built a high place for Shemash, the abomination of Moab, and for Moloch, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. They're, what they're saying is Solomon did this for all those other gods. You know why? Mm -hmm. Well, everybody brought him all those women. He had all those nations to please. Try to be nice. He just... Try to get along here. Can't we all uh, just get along? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh. Yep, and it says Yahweh busted him all up for that, yeah. Well, anyway. But look what he says he did yeah. next. Solomon built a magnificent temple for Yahweh in Jerusalem. However, the temple was built after the model of Canaanite temples. <laughs> <laughs> along with the new temple came a new theology. 
The theology developed in Jerusalem would be a combination of Israelite and Canaanite religious ideas. Hey, we can't all get along. The purpose of this new theology was to create a national theology. Traditional Canaanite understandings of El were transferred to Yahweh and then made compatible with Israelite history. The new national theology of Yahweh would then be compatible with Israelite culture and customs and serve to unite the Israelite and the Canaanite population and to form a united country. And many of the attempts at religious reforms during that period of the monarchy were mostly related to the official religion as practiced in the Temple of Jerusalem. Archaeological discoveries seem to indicate that the religious life and the piety of most of the population remain largely unaffected. <laughs> it's what people do. The secretistic practices in the local shrines also seem to demonstrate that personal religion was not affected by the efforts of the reforms to establish the worship of Yahweh as the only valid religious expression in Israel. The statement that Yahweh was angry with Solomon was an indictment on the religious practices promoted by Solomon in Jerusalem. And the Bible tells us that the practices of Solomon's introduction of foreign religious practices into the life of the nation, divine judgment came upon him and his kingdom. Yahweh said to Solomon, Since this has been your practice, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you, and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David and your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. In addition, Yahweh raised up two adversaries, two Satans, against Solomon. One was Hadad, the Edomite, and the other was Rezan, the son of Aledia. A third adversary was Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, in whom the ten tribes were given at the time of the division of the kingdom. Solomon's religious and economic policies generated much unrest in Israel and caused the division of the monarchy along geographical lines and the division of the kingdom came mostly because of the oppressive policies of Solomon. However, the Deuteronomic historian presents the division of the kingdom in religious terms. According to the Deuteronomic historian, northern tribes revolted because there were groups of people within the northern tribes who were longing for religious reforms. Well, sounds like today. When Jeroboam became king of the ten tribes that formed in the northern kingdom, the center of worship was in Jerusalem and he feared that the people would go up to Jerusalem to celebrate the major festivals and to offer sacrifices in the temple. So he concluded there was a risk that they would retain their allegiance to Rehoboam and thus compromise the security of his kingdom. To address this situation, Jeroboam established two centers of worship, one at Dan, the northernmost city of the northern kingdom, and the other at Bethel, the southern border with Judah. He also built two golden calves, or bulls, to serve as the symbol of worship. To maintain the cultic centers in Dan and Bethel, Jeroboam selected people who were not from the tribe of Levi to become priests in these temples and in the high places that were established throughout the kingdom. There is much controversy about the symbolism of the calves or bulls placed in Dan and Bethel. The bull was a symbol of El and Baal and the fertility god of the Canaanites. It had been suggested that in establishing the bulls as a symbol, Jeroboam was not promoting idolatry but rather giving official recognition to the traditional way the people of Israel worshipped Yahweh as El. As El. And Jeroboam's reforms were not seen in a positive light by the writers of the Book of Kings. The Deuteronomists saw Jeroboam's reforms as a rejection of Yahweh. And as a result, Jeroboam is condemned by the Deuteronomists because he set up the golden calves which became the focus of Israel's worship and because he established centers of worship outside Jerusalem. Oh, heavens, no. And the worship of Yahweh in the form of a bull opened up the doors for the influence of the Canaanite culture and religion to enter the life of the northern kingdom. Whatever intentions Jeroboam might have had, the commoning of Yahweh worship with Baal symbolism was established. Hosea was the first prophet who openly criticized the worship of the calf. In Hosea, the prophet criticizes the worship of the calf on behalf of Yahweh. I have spurned your calf, O Samaria. My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of innocence? For it is from Israel. A craftsman made it. It is not God. The calf of Samaria shall be broken to pieces. Now after the death of Jeroboam, the kings who followed him continued the religious practices established by Jeroboam. 
leading to the general condemnation of every king of Israel. Each king was condemned for doing what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, for walking in the way of Jeroboam, and by allowing the worship of the golden calf to remain in place. And in the end, the Deuteronomic historian and for the northern kingdom. The people of Israel had sinned against Yahweh. They despised his statues and his covenant that he made with their fathers and the warnings that he gave them. They went after false gods and idols, and they followed the nations concerning whom Yahweh had commanded them that they should not do like them. And they abandoned all the commandments of the Lord their God and made for themselves metal images of two calves. And they made an Asherah and worshipped all the host. So they said the northern kingdom would pay for their crimes against Yahweh. And then it happened. The northern kingdom was indeed conquered by Assyria and taken into exile in 722 BC. But guess what? So was Jerusalem. They were conquered the very next year. Look, a whole host of pagan practices and symbols were absorbed into Christianity. This was in an effort to convert those worshipping pagan religions. And old pagan ideas were simply given new names and assigned new meanings. One of the better known examples of religious syncretism is Christmas. Christmas was invented as a substitute for the older pagan Yule celebrations. Instead of worshipping a sun god on the 25th of December, the pagan was told he was now worshipping the Son of God. The symbols and rituals and practices all remained only under new labels. Bible evidence shows that the birth of Christ was in the fall of the year, likely late September or early October at the latest, and not December 25th. Some think the idea of syncretism was good and is a means of showing that Christianity is not exclusive of other religions and their paths to God. However, it sure is confusing trying to untangle and find the one true Father. Gotta pay attention. Hey, thanks for listening. I commend you if you made it this far all the way to the end of this video. History can sometimes be awfully boring, but this is a story that needed to be brought out. One last little thing I wanted to remind everybody of. This poem concerning the Northern Kingdom and all their practices and even building temples to remind them of the Northern Kingdom gods. Let's keep in mind that Jesus was from Galilee and that, of course, was in the Northern Kingdom.